Now, imagine um, being trapped in a world where the past refuses to stay in the past, where every sound, every smell, every memory has the power to transport you back to a place of darkness and fear. And that happens for millions of people because this is really the harsh reality of living with trauma. But what if we could create a world where trauma survivors feel seen, they feel heard and empowered? A world where their experiences are acknowledged, validated and supported. With this, I want to welcome every one of us to our Awareness to Action program that is empowering change to trauma-informed care. And tonight, as we gather to shine a light on the impact of trauma and to explore the transformative power of trauma-informed care, I want to use this opportunity to say you're welcome. My name is Blessing Apoko. I'm a mental health counselor and advocate of mental health. Okay, and with me, I have A. Grace Olotu, and I have um, Tessie Ilozmi. Please, um, Miss, is it Miss or Mrs? Tessie, Mrs. Just, you can just call me Tessie, no need for Mrs. or Miss, but I'm Mrs. actually. <laughs> okay, Mrs. Mrs. Tessie, please permit me. <laughs> it's okay. Okay. Fine. And I really want to say thank you for acknowledging this um the invitation to be here i really appreciate it please can you introduce yourself to us okay my name is tessie Ilozwe. um i am a lot of things but for the purpose of today's meeting i'm a mental health counselor and a marriage and a family therapist i am also a self-discovery and a mind re a cognitive reconditioning coach that's basically who i am i live in abuja uh, I have over a hundred hours of practice to my belt. Um, what else? That's me. I'm a media person as well. Uh, I'm a producer and a TV presenter. So yeah, wow. that's the that's thing about me. <laughs> it's really nice meeting you. Today we're talking about trauma, trauma-informed care actually. So what is trauma-informed care? For me, it is an approach that recognizes the prevalence of trauma, that recognizes trauma in the lives of individuals and families. It acknowledges the impact of trauma that is on physical, emotional, and behavioral well-being. And strives, it strives to create a safe, supportive, and empowering environment for healing. For me, that is what trauma is. It is the fact that we have to acknowledge it and then we have to heal from what we've been going through. And in here, I have a few questions for our guests. And while we're waiting for A. Grace to come in, Tessie, I'd like um, you to share a personal experience with trauma if that's possible and how it has actually impacted your life because for me i remember i when i was growing up i remember having um something that actually changed my life it is something huge i was this church girl okay i go to church i was the pastor's assistant i do the work of god okay and then after church, one event, um, it was a church event, and after that event, while going on, I, you know, because of the crowd, the, the headquarter is actually a very big church. So because of the crowd, they, they, they ask people to offer others rights. Like, if you're going and someone is going your way, please drop the person. And then this is, I don't think I've said this out loud and I'm saying it today because I believe my healing is, is there. I'm healing. Okay. So while, um, after church, I was, my house is a bit far from 
from the church. So, and, you know, when they made an announcement that please carry whoever is going on your way. So I joined this car and, and whenever, before now, before I got into this profession, before I had the idea of what trauma is, okay, this happened along the line. After talking to someone about it, I felt like, okay, this is my healing journey. I have to move past this stuff. So, but that night, while I joined that car, was actually the worst night of my life. Wow. See, because people actually live with these things. There are rape, rape causes trauma. There are deaths, the, the loss of loved ones and all that. But that night was, wasn't a night, um, initially I would say I don't want to recall. Because you know, with trauma, there's always a denial. Yeah. Yeah, so I kept denying the fact that it happened. But because of that incident, because of that rape incident, yeah. the, the, you know, the zeal that I had going to church mm. was out of it. Because you know that, that <laughs> the mindset where you're in a situation and you just hope that God will just come down and carry you away from there. Didn't yeah. And that took me out of the church for several years okay and you know it kept lingering till i became who i am like till i know the importance of knowing these things the importance of accepting what has happened and moving on mm. so i um can you share a personal story with us what you've really gone through as this the impact this trauma has actually caused okay so um while i was listening to you share i often when i have clients and i'm dealing with trauma the truth is sometimes i try to go into myself to say okay what traumatic experience have i had before now you know when you try to feel woke you say things like oh um i was um i was almost raped by this person and it's a trauma but then when i think about the situation i really do not have any backlash as sort i don't have any it, it doesn't do anything to me it, it, i just remember it as an event so while for some other people that may have been traumatic it wasn't traumatic for me really because i remember it as an event there's no um pain or you know faint nothing like that is happening however while you were talking i i was going through my mind because you said i should think i should share a person and i'm like which personal problem would i share now not someone i have met you know i have cancer and i remember that um i get very uh what's the word i get very agitated when i hear loud screaming and shouting and I, I always wondered like what is this thing but now that i think about it i remember um a few times when i don't know if this is the situation that caused it but my mom and my dad had like some fight i've never seen my mom and my dad fight before you know but then one time when i was really i think i was a teenager then it was just me and my younger brother uh, i have th four three siblings but then it was just me and my younger brother and we walked in and my my parents had locked the door i walked in and they had locked the door and my dad was you know screaming at my mom my mom was so i walked in seeing them fighting literally yeah and then this is new to me because they've never fought they, this is like a from nowhere so i was wondering what's going on and i see my my dad's um shirt stained with blood and then i see my mom's face is swollen and they are having a go at it and i'm like is this what you people i remember asking that question is this what you people want me to be doing when i grow up you know i was so petrified i was so 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 scared i so every time now that was an event that passed though everything looked like it was okay it didn't happen but every time i hear people raising their voices at each other my heart skips a bit like it starts to raise and i start to think of all the possible things that could be going on like is somebody about to be beaten somebody about to be killed so every time i hear that it goes like that it's not been easy having to put my mind steady but to think that a small situation that never because it only happened once that situation had changed everything about me so where people would hear sounds i want to go and know what's happening 
me i will hear sounds i want to know what's happening oh but i am first of all scared and i'm looking for how to protect myself because i felt unprotected that day i saw my parents you know going having a go at each other i felt very very unprotected and that has lived with me even up until now i can't if i'm walking around at night and i just hear people shouting one kind of shout like this that's the end for me my heart starts to raise all my defense mechanism enters into play and boom i'm fighting because my my um how i respond to challenges or fear or anything is to fight i'm a fighter i don't freeze i don't flight i fight so the first thing that comes to my mind is how do i defend myself that's the first thing that i'm thinking of so yeah i think that's the personal traumatic experience that i have had and you know it's getting better every time but i still have to live with the effects of hearing a loud noise all right Tessie, thank you for sharing that amazing experience with us it's amazing because um you you're able to recognize it and yeah. of course you're able you're willing and able to um, overcome that experience okay it's not easy actually overcoming um stuffs like that traumatic events like that is not a one-day journey mm. it's not something you just do all of a sudden yeah. and then everything is fine no it's a, a progress continually hey grace thank you for joining can you introduce yourself to us okay my name is eggy grace uh, a mental health advocate and a triggered gender-based violence advocate while working as a program manager. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, before now, I shared my story of the impact, my personal story of the impact of trauma, what it actually did to me for so many years. And after sharing that, Tessie also shared hers. Initially, she thought she didn't have any trauma, but she had to dig deep to um, really find out, to really know, to, to really bring out what she went through um, herself. So she shared her own story and would like you to share yours with us too. Do you have any traumatic experiences that you've been battling with that you've been able to conquer one way or the other. One of the things that which I got me very traumatized while growing up as a child, I would say I'm very trying to major things. Sexual abuse and okay my my parents growing up. So growing up I realized that like my mom and dad separated. Like my mom went away, my dad had a we so we had to grow up with my dad and my siblings. And I realized that, okay, over time, I felt like, oh, it's like, life. there was a reason for the separation. But as I grew more older, I became super scared of relationship, or let me use the word marriage. Because it started building in me that this mentality of, what if you get married and you separate? Like, unconsciously, in as, as I'm looking, I'm like, the last thing I want to do is to either go my separate ways for my spouse and let my children go to it. Because I told myself, like, if my mom and dad didn't separate, probably there are certain things that I would have been able to avoid as a child. Because for that to be married, it took some time. So, like, I felt that way because just in those seasons, I got sexually abused by a neighbor and a family member. So I felt like if, if these people are not going go on their separate ways, should have had enough time to put eyes on the children. So for me, it was, it was quite traumatic. Even at this adult stage, the day where I, when I took off marriage, I'm like, God, I don't want to get married and I get separated from my spouse, not for any reason. So back then, it's built a consistent issue of trauma. I have to now consciously tell myself, okay, you know, irrespective of whatever happened in your parents' marriage, it is not your marriage marriage so I have to now consciously tell myself that my parents' marriage is not my marriage. They don't define the bedrock of marriage for me. I can't get married and not separate from my spouse irrespective of any issue that I have to consciously now build my 
sense of that, irrespective of the trauma of childhood, I'm not going to pass it to my adult stage or my children when I eventually get married. Mm. So, yeah. Actually, that, that's, <coughs> it's, like I said, the trauma is, is not something that just goes away, okay? You've experienced it. Why it's called trauma keeps lingering in your brain, in your head. It takes years, and you're still thinking about that same thing. But the beautiful thing is, it actually does not need to affect you. Okay? Mm -hmm. It does not need to be part of your life. That's the past. So definitely the past should be in the past. And building yourself or moving forward from that past is, is, is a step that is so vital. And I appreciate every one of us, including myself, for moving past that stage. We are still working. It's a work in progress. We are not saying we are woefully. Because sometimes I just sit and then I think about event and i have tried like i've tried going back to church but going back to church would not bring back that um the way i was before okay because things have changed life has changed and everything but we'll keep going and we'll keep moving forward and we'll keep coming out stronger okay um our second question for today is how do you think trauma-informed care can benefit individuals and community? This trauma-informed care, this empowerment, this knowledge that we're sharing today, how do you think it can actually benefit an individual like me that has been through trauma, like yourself that has been through trauma, or a community that has individuals there that are going through one thing or the other? How do you think this information can actually benefit them? Hey, Grace. Okay. okay, personally, I would say number one, it will help them heal from their pain. You know, one in the recent world we had today, one of the things people have realized that people do is people see hurt as normal. When you tell someone, I'm going through this, they just see like it's part of life, just survive and live through. I was talking to a friend and I was like, when um, we get hurt from friendship, it's not okay to get hurt from friendship because you trusted these people. It's not okay to get hurt. It's not okay for your family members to hurt you. It's not okay for you to go through severe abuse and don't talk about it. So this um, trauma-informed care, what it's going to do, it's going to give them a change of mindset that, okay, irrespective of the trauma you have gone through, irrespective of whatever you are going through, you don't have to stay there. You don't have to stay in the past and let whatever happened during childhood take the best of you. But I've seen situations where people commit suicide, people went into depression based on either trauma or depression from childhood. So talking to people about this um, trauma-informed care more would give a lot of awareness to say, okay, there's, there's an opportunity for you to heal. There's an opportunity to let go. There's an opportunity for your mind to be renewed. There's hope to live again, basically. Okay, thank you. Because I knew that if I had had this information when that incident happened to me, probably I would have talked to somebody about it. But yeah. for a very long time, I never said anything, not even to my siblings, okay? Because I wasn't aware what this is. I wasn't aware mm -hmm. of the damage it would cause in the future if I had not talked about it. So I just kept it to myself and I was just crying and crying and nobody even knew what was going on. So putting this information out there really, will really help those people or individuals that are going through um, a certain event but are not able to say it or to express themselves. So yes, yes. that's really yes. good. Especially, especially for really? sexual abuse, hey. especially, especially abuse cases, you know in a world where the moment you tell somebody I've been raped, or uh, I got molested, there's this kind of disdain look they give to you, like, oh, wow, like, 
and it's so bad because even if somebody wants to probably share, it kills them because the first thing they'll be like, the society they'll ask you, where were you before you got raped? What clothes were you wearing? So giving them the opportunity to talk and not even judge them, irrespective of whatever happened, would really make people open up to say, okay, oh, this is, and I think even from families, one thing I was telling somebody is that our families need to do better, our parents need to do better. The kind of family that I'm seeing in the world today is a family where there's no serious um, attention that's being paid to a child because their children are going through trauma. But for the fact that it is that they came from a family where they, they are not allowed to talk freely, there's always this shouting, there's no safe space there, or probably the moment you talk about it, just know that you are dead, your life is. So we need to wound incorporated in our family we need to talk to the parents about it that come on give your child space that there's a lot of things that these children want to go to, um, want to talk about i was having a counseling session with some students and they realized that there's so much burden in their heart that they don't talk about but they don't even have the opportunity to go or meet their parents to say okay this is what is happening there are people that their family members have molesting them in the house but they cannot meet their friends talk about it because either their mom is going to beat them and which is not supposed to be so so our parents even need to learn how to really handle trauma especially in the child of um, children yes thank you so much um uh tessie Ilozwe, please how can we create a safe space like she said we have to create a safe space okay even in the family because the adults, those that are not informed, would just, according to her, say, beat the child. Or because of the fear that, okay, my mommy will beat me if I say this. And then they are not talking. Despite what they've gone through, they'll keep, um, keep it inside of them. And, you know, keeping that inside is actually causing more damage to that individual than good. So how can we create a safe space, a supportive space? for these individuals who have experienced that trauma, who have experienced something they actually cannot talk about because of the fear, the stigma, and every other thing. The first thing is information, and, and that's what everyone has said. You cannot solve a problem if, you don't, if they don't understand what the problem is. So I, I like that what is, you know, when you talk about trauma, what people talk about a lot is sexual abuse and then they move on to domestic abuse you know and then they move on to things like uh verbal abuse where you have bullying and all of those things that you now move on to emotional abuse but people one thing is that trauma is so much more than all the abuses trauma could be i was eating a uh, fish at home as a child and the fish the bone of the fish was stuck in my throat and somehow it became a very serious medical issue i was saved of course the bone was removed whatever it was but now i can't eat fish anymore and when i say i don't want to eat fish so for example i'm among friends and i'm amongst family members and i don't want to eat fish everybody looks at me weird like what's wrong with you why are you selective you know even parents will say why are you selecting food you don't know how this is it because i gave you fish but they don't understand that that child has had or that person has had a traumatic experience with food so some of the allergies that we say or use words like i'm allergic to you are not allergic to them because allergy could be medical yes we know that where your body cannot stand certain things when you have allergies you have breakouts some of those breakouts are actually somatic in the sense that they are happening because your mind you have told your mind several times that that particular meal isn't good for you so for every time you consume it you will always have a problem because of that, that traumatic experience so the first thing is even information do people know what trauma is trauma is beyond let's we need to start letting people know trauma is beyond what people say it is trauma is deeper than what it is trauma is an experience that blew you off it could even be that you saw a dead body for the first time in your life that experience stays with you that is a traumatic experience it's something that your mind can't seem to shake off every time you remember so for me i think the first thing in 
creating a safe space is to actually give information we need to inform everybody everybody needs to know we need to shout about it we need to share about it we need to have trauma is not spoken about enough it is not we only talk about trauma when we're trying to say somebody did this and the person did this because of that no trauma can be in every single aspect of our life every one of us has a 99 percent chance of experiencing having a traumatic experience in their life and unless we know what those experiences are like i shared with you earlier how i didn't know that that experience with my parents was a traumatic i kept wondering why do i get agitated and so scared whenever i hear people shouting at the top of their voices i didn't realize that that's what it was but now i know that that's exactly what it was because for me that experience was like out of the blue it's different if you know when you're growing up and you have been hearing it you know you hear them shout at each other small you know you hear then the voice start increasing so you get used to it and for you it's not trauma but it it was from nowhere so obviously it was a new experience and it was an experience that stayed with me in fact what i didn't tell you when i was sharing was one of the major things that i told my husband when we were getting married is you see this raising of voice please i beg of you don't raise your voice at me if you want to talk you have to find a way to say it if you're angry maybe don't say anything but if you shout at me i will start crying and honestly that's how it is with me once someone starts to scream or raise their voice at me i start crying because i still have memories of that it's like that it's like i'm reliving that day again over and over again so for me first first thing before we start spreading it everywhere is information we need to let people know what trauma really is if they know they will become aware yes that's a good one because i um i know that or i felt trauma is just um, about um the sexual abuse the emotional abuse and every other kind of abuse but i when you were talking i you, you said something about the fish the bone yes i remember i had a similar experience okay and that um that was on you see eba people swallow gary but after the experience i had with gary for several years i've not swallowed anything that is ever <laughs> <laughs> i don't swallow it at all because of the experience i had yeah <laughs> you see because now whenever i swallow a bar i have this constipation like something and the first time that thing happened to me like i threw up every of me i was after throwing up, I was light as feather, see where the world wants to end. <laughs> so after realizing how that thing usually affects me, yeah. I stopped suffering about. So that is actually a traumatic event. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it is. It is. yes. So information is really key. Really mean, yeah. Yes. Thank you for sharing that one. I really it really opened my eyes to see this thing. So <laughs> Okay, hey Grace, I hope you're still here with us. <laughs> yeah, I'm here. Okay. What are some common misconceptions about trauma and disinformation? What are the misconceptions there? If, if you're not crying or you're not going through things, it's not trauma. Mm. No, somebody. Because most of okay, because, because now I. I I hate swallowing a bar now because of the event. And yeah. then if I tell someone, they'll just look at me and say, mm -hmm. now big girl, they worry. You, you understand? They don't understand that. What I went through was, was out of this world. I felt like I was dying. You know, when you're consistently throwing up, you're throwing up for hours, the thing is not stopping. And I was feeling so light. You know, telling somebody now, they'll be like, mm -hmm. go, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing do you now just be getting worry, but they, they don't understand. So it's really I amazing. Think, it's really amazing. And I think one of the misconceptions we won't have about trauma is we believe that if we are not in the shoe, then the person is not serious. Mm. We believe that because I think there was a time I was having a conversation with a friend and she was like, You enjoy seeing indoors. I was like, dude, um, I don't think what's scared, but so much crowd gets me super scared. It puts me under a lot of pressure. And 
that can be very overwhelming. For example, now, sometimes I love my friends being around. But when they're more than one, two, three, the house is becoming choky. For example, now, all this Christmas season where everybody is in the house, I, I, I don't know, for, for me, it used to be an overwhelming season. Because I'm, mm. I'm like, can you people just can you just say not make noise? I don't like noise. It 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 gives me a lot of headaches. I don't like my phone ringing out so loud. It's so when I tell people that ah, okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you. So yeah, those are like things I'm. Um, People will all believe that uh, this thing is not serious at all. Because why will you even tell me you're scared of crowd? Like, why? Why will you tell me you don't want your phone to ring? Like, so people don't feel like if it's not them that is going through it, then it's not important. Then another misconception, uh, misconception people have about trauma is trauma is not life threatening. Funny enough, it's, it's, trauma can literally threaten your life. That I've seen people commit suicide over simple things that you think that's not important. You just sit there and if you hear their story, funny enough, it might not be like so much big um big something for them to commit suicide. But you just see people hearing a case, ah somebody somebody committed suicide and you're hearing the backstory and you're like, okay. Some people will be like this does not demand suicide. But for the person, it was really life threatening. That was why the person had to um coming to side and i think another misconception is that people we really did trauma only affects the weak person the moment you tell somebody i'm traumatized they just believe you are very weak you you, you don't have somebody will say you don't have the strong mind i just feel like ah this person is a weakling this person does not this person does not have things and funny enough it happens in families. I think, funny enough, I'm always relating them back to family because you see an elder one and a younger one, like for my family now, there's this session that I don't like fights. So when I see people fighting, it gives me a lot of trauma because I'm like, okay, why are you fighting? Why the noise? So whenever there's a fight, I'm always avoiding it. People don't know that for me it's traumatizing to either engage in a fight or watch people fight. So my family just believe that as the first born, you are very weak, you don't have power. Yeah, in all this misconception, there are people that are very strong, they are going through trauma, and if they don't even talk about it, you will not know that this person is really going through a lot. Like um Tessie said, it's not just trauma is not just based on either Surgery abuse, surgery violence, like little things that we feel like this thing is not important and can really cause a lot of trauma. So, in this misconception, now, how do we put it out there to let these people understand that what somebody is going through is not a child's play? Because um, I have a I have a child. It's my sister's child. Okay, I'm not supposed to put it out there, but when it happened to her okay i i was fortunate to be there with her when she came back she was crying and we talked about it in fact she never even said anything that happened to her she just went straight and then took something we didn't know the next thing she was on the floor it was after we were able to revive her and i took her somewhere and be like what happened and then she told me what happened how she told me was because I was I was open. You know, most yeah. times you have to be open for them to be open. Yes, exactly. So, so I had to be open. I had to tell her my own experiences for her to be able to feel safe to talk to me at that point. And then when she made mention of this. I actually, I quickly looked for a solution. And that was it. So in removing all, all 
this misconceptions from the idea of people what can we actually do aside from being open because most times people don't even want to talk even if you're open they still would not want to talk what do you think they don't want we to do the society, has, the society has actually judged a lot of people the the society has made it look like if you're going through certain things then something deeply is wrong with you and i think one of the things that with people is people don't like being judged no matter the word you want to use i don't know for anybody but for me do not judge me because you don't know how much pain yeah. this has crushed me the one trauma that i grew up with was i fell into the well at a very young age so currently at this stage when i see well i don't like wells i don't like well because whenever i see well the memory of how i fell into a well keeps playing back and so when i'm with people and they say let's draw water from well and i'm like i cannot draw water from well people will be like are you okay why can't you draw water from well? I'm like i cannot draw water from well we need to learn how to adapt to people because that is where people tell us all certain things they've gone through we 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 overlook it that's the truth we overlook it we just feel like ah this person is let me use the word nigerian word this person is overdoing this yeah. we need to understand that everybody has their challenges everybody has their experience and the way we react to things are very different for example you might be a very strong person that okay when things happen you just overlook it for me i know i can be very emotional and i can be a weakling sometimes like even a little fight with my friends i can go back and sit down and cry because i feel like i've hurt them but there are people that don't even care or just overlook it and everybody will come around so we need to learn how to pass the right information i know people when it's a dream, people don't really open up but irrespective of people not opening up we should not give up and if you want to start from our secondary schools our primary schools we need to have conversations with the students with the children probably do right i feel like our parents the parents of this generation i feel like they need to have um an awareness program where they will sit down and like experienced people will teach them and said these are better ways to handle certain things there are ways that sometimes children don't need showers there's a lot that shout let me even say my own i'm not supposed to say this but my younger brother my house is house okay any little thing everybody's trying to correct you so there's a lot of shouting going on here and there and currently he's 14. one of the things i realize is that when he whenever he sees his mates outside he's so bold and he's so strong like he's very outspoken but the moment he's stepping his feet into the house he becomes so timid shy away from conversation and i realize that it can it could be that okay this was because of the experience he had going through he has this mentality that oh more this house is shout house let me just respect myself so even when people are doing certain stuff we just speak to himself and which is not right our home should not be like that home should be a safe space where if anything happens our home should be the first place we should be able to actually run to yeah. we actually need to do more better in communication like yes this should i think i think this should be the um this awareness should be created or should be started from the family it should start from the yeah. family the family needs to be aware the family needs to be out there for for the kids for an individual okay the judgment should end from the family because if it doesn't end from the family it will move to the society and once yeah. it's society how do we now cope how do we now try to manage it from that society because if your home cannot help you um move away from, from that that trauma will the society be able to so these are the things we should share with families and from because i know every system starts from the family the family is the first is the first point for a child when a child 
starts growing up, it's the family that comes first before he's been sent to school and then to the society and every other thing. So the family is very important in putting out this information there. So how do we now help this family understand that they have to do this? And yes, we have to communicate this every single time. But how do we make sure, how do we want them to listen? Is it through um, constant awareness? Or, I don't know, how do we just do all this? Uh, okay, so there are so many ways to pass an information or pass information that you want to get across. First of all, we must understand that Africa, Nigeria is a patriarchy um, country where um, certain cultures and traditions are upheld above every other thing. In fact, there are traditions and culture that supersedes whatever you feel. Your feelings can be thrown in the trash. It doesn't matter. It's our tradition and and so there's going to be a bit of struggle when you want to implement certain things. However, I can tell you that the same way that we now consume a lot of music, consume a lot of comedy, consume a lot of challenges. I mean, there are a gazillion challenges out there. I have no idea what they all are. And they just keep popping up every day. And everybody, somehow I ask myself, how is somebody able to learn this complicated dance and put it up on social media in less than a week? It must have taken you hours to practice, you know, to get it right, because you won't get it right the first time. It means that people... If you put something in front of people constantly, they're going to get it. So one of the ways I think that we can do it, first of all, as professionals, we all come from families. If we can all begin to educate, start with our own families and start to do the best that we can individually to educate. You know how that thing they used to say that it, it takes a village to train a child. We need to go back to that. We need to go back to becoming our brother and our sister's keeper. I know that it may be hard because that your neighbor feels like you know too much. So he's not going to let your child come in. That you're like, what do you know? You're such a small girl. How many life you don't see? They tell me about trauma. There's going to be a lot of people going against you. But what you can start to do in your own little way, what we can start to do is just start to put out word and help people. When you see people are pregnant, because this thing we're talking about, trauma starts from pregnancy. I... I, I know that people don't know, but wh whatever you feel when you're carrying your child affects the character and the personality of the child when they come out. Yes, they will have your DNA and your personality, but the way that child feels, the feelings you carried all through that pregnancy affects the child. And so you imagine a child comes out and the child at a very little age already starts to cry consistently. And you're wondering, why is this child always crying? Why is it? The question you want to ask yourself is, what mood, what emotions were you displaying when you were pregnant with this child? The same way the child feeds off you, the child feeds off your emotion. That's why sometimes you play a certain song in, in, when the child is born and the child's eyes just lights up. If you trace it back, that child has heard that song before. It is not new to the child. So you, it, it starts from our, from our pregnant, from the hospitals. When people are going for a tenatal, we need to have mental health counselors who are helping pregnant women understand that they need to be okay so that their child can be okay from that moment once they start to understand that the way they behave the children are affected when they give birth and they are going for the same um, postnatal care they are able to tell them at the at the immunization centers there's a mental health counselor who is present who is able to help them through there's a family counselor who is there to tell them hey this was going on because some of those women have partners that don't understand what's going on and constantly there so the the, the husbands as well need to be told the baby daddies as well need to go through compulsory trainings you know, to say, hey, let's let's put ourselves, I mean, we're mental health counselors, let's spread ourselves thin. Go to all the antenatal place and tell them you want to come and talk about mental health. You don't need to do anything. All you need to do is, as long as nobody's paying you, just say it's free. 
everybody will show up trust me they will show up you know by the time we start to do this consistently at some point what we are doing is we are sowing the seed of information that the way i behave it depends this child can turn out to be like this this child can turn out to be like this and the parents can also start to heal and from there we can start creating content let's create a challenge a challenge of how many people have you hugged today or hugged 10 people on the streets today record yourself doing it and put it up on social media is a hug a hug a child challenge or hug your your parent for for five minutes challenge something we need to be as aggressive as the world is with whatever agenda that they are pulling so for me you can never underemphasize the fact that content and information we have social media we are here having this life and we're talking about something that matters these are the things that we need to be sharing with people this information you're sharing even the best of the best mental health counselors in court some of them are not privileged to have this information i can tell you categorically about this information because i read because i study because i really want to help people and so i go far and beyond to know what the problem is but some of us do not we just believe it's just even some of the counselors you're talking to them about a baby having trauma and they're like babies having trauma and it's looking strange to them but when you talk to a pediatrician they can tell you clearly that yes a child can be displaying or falling sick at an early age because of a traumatic experience that that child may have had even before the child has lived long so for me that's how we spread it that's that's the best way spread the content talk about it shout about it create t-shirts about it be aggressive about the whole thing you know i think that's how we can spread i think that's the question you asked me that's how we can spread um education yeah, yeah that's it education that's is it. really amazing you know they say education is key no matter what let's fight the whole um, the way the world is moving being educated or knowing what you're supposed to know at the right time is really empowering. Yes. Yeah. Really, really, really empowering. I read books and when I say a word that is foreign to me, I actually want to know more about that word. But yeah. that time I, I want to browse all the <laughs> all the synonyms and antonyms of that word. So education is really the key, putting it out there. And you said something about starting from the pregnancy, like you start, and I, I also um, believe the power of self-talk, the power of self-talk as a pregnant woman talking to your child positively, you know, like you said, your emotions during pregnancy, yeah. it's really vital how you treat yourself, yeah. how you behave during pregnancy can really mm -hmm. affect child and that could be traumatic because the child has already experienced it you know some people they say um it is not anything you're doing um when the child is inside your belly does not really matter it is when mm -hmm. the child is outside but it really, it really yeah. does yeah. they they have things they are humans yeah of course so they have mental health yeah <laughs> so that's really amazing thank you for sharing that now let's go to our next question you know um i i made mention of supporting my sister back then or my daughter back then when she had her own experience yeah. so while counseling others that are not related to us you know, because she was my sister, I put my, I, um, I had to put out my out out there. I told her everything that happened to me and all that. So she was able to open up to me. Well, how can we balance the boundaries and empathy when supporting someone who has experienced trauma? How can we balance the emotions, balance the empathy, you know, the boundaries, the set boundaries concerning um, an individual? that is going through a lot or that has gone through trauma or that is going through trauma yeah um well for, uh, the thing is as professionals we are we are taught to of course have empathy and not sympathy and um also to understand the place of a client and the place of the counselor now when you when you want to help someone who is being through a traumatic experience, you want to switch quickly into your shoes of a counselor and understand and try not to have emotions, which is why a lot of times 
um, it is not advisable to cancel your family members because you're already emotionally attached. Your biases are a lot. You have a gazillion biases. Um, so the, the tendency that you're going to approach that client or that situation with a lot of biases is there. And when, you, when there's a bias in, in cancelling, that's the end of the cancelling. That's advice now. That's yeah. revenge or whatever you want to call it. It's not cancelling. So best, first things first is if you are unable for... Okay, so for example, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. Um, I'm able to cancel some of my family members because I take my job seriously. As much as I know this person a lot, I put myself in the place of a professional so that I can help them. I try as much as possible to make questions that I already know. I ask them because the truth is you can be convinced that you know somebody, but you really don't. Mm. And then if the client is also willing to share a lot with you because you know you may be living with somebody but there are things about themselves they don't want you to know and so there comes the problem when you're a professional trying to do your job so um so for example imagine me cancelling my husband there's a there's a tendency that i will get upset at certain things you say you know or I will try to tell him you are lying, you are lying, you know, because I feel like I know him. But uh, what I've learned, because I had to cancel my husband at some point, I still do once in a while. What I learned is that if I can put myself in the shoes of a professional and understand that I am trying to help somebody find their life, it takes away the emotions. It takes away the when we now finish the session, I can later go and say, hey, you know, this thing you're doing this thing you're doing this is actually great and i'm sorry that i feel it gives me an advantage but if you're not able to create that boundary if you have not practiced enough to put your biases aside it's always better to refer that client as much as possible advise the person try to step in the best that you can as a counselor but please have a friend or two who are counselors as well who you trust their expertise and refer them and please don't try to ask them for the notes especially if they are no minors if they are minors however because a parent must be involved so you can ask for the notes of the session so you know what goes on but that parent must also be made to understand or the caregiver that you cannot use the client's notes against them in the house you know how someone has finished doing a session with a child and then the mom knows what happened what the child said about their mom and he say eh so so that you next time you go and see the counselor you can now say that i'm doing this abby oh so that's what and that scars the child and stops them from even trusting their counselor because now the information that was meant to be confidential has now been told to the one person they did not want to know you know because this is happening with them and they still live with the person so it's a bit dicey Usually, it's always better. Refer that person. If you know the person closely, you may give first aid. Do your first aid. But immediately after your first aid, and you know this person needs some more counseling, some more therapy, if you can't suspend your biases, and if you feel like this person will not trust you enough, please refer. And try not to ask for the notes, except if the person is a minor. That's, that's, my, that's what I say. Yeah. Thank you. I remember that um, there was a time I had a client that was actually family. You know, like you said, um, if we're talking to family, because normally it's not advisable, okay, to cancel your family unless you can move away the biases, okay? But um, at that particular time, I knew that I don't have to attend to this person. I've done my first aid. I know that, okay, this is, this is what I have to refer so I, I i just quickly referred the person to to another uh, another counselor i met online and i think she really did a great job so it's not everything we have to take in okay so setting boundaries is really really very important i had to like yeah. i didn't want to go in total mm -hmm. you understand mm -hmm. so yeah if um he was even willing to open up to me yeah yeah because you know most times they feel like okay you've known me too much and then yeah want to talk yeah so, yes 
yeah that's that's really great Thank that's you that's saying. also an advantage you know that sorry to cut you there but because that's that's something i have experienced and i know is an advantage there are people who therapy is a, is a first for them they have never had it before it's going to be stranger talking to a stranger that you mm. know do you understand it's going to be really strange talking to a stranger that you don't know from anywhere telling them how you feel however because that person trusts you they are able to say now me be this like they are able to open up so well and then it is the honors is now on you to take that information and give them the best care that they can get without any of your biases getting in the way so it can be an advantage actually to help a family member when you can put yourself in control however if you can't it's always best to refer just like you said yeah thank you and that brings us to um self-care giving them the best care so what um, self-care practices do you recommend for individuals who have experienced trauma? Like I've experienced trauma now and I need, I'm feeling this down and I need to, you know, get myself back. What self-care practices would you recommend? Don't stay in your trauma. That's the first one for me. Don't live in the trauma. It's an experience like every other experience you've had. However, it stands out because you your mind or your brain has made it important because what happens when you go through a traumatic experience you have so many experiences but one of those events becomes a traumatic experience because it is it hits you differently it causes something in you either it causes you a physical damage or it causes you a mental damage or it cause it always does something to you so the first thing you want to tell someone who is going to who has had any form of trauma or let's just say telling ourselves who have had trauma and any other person is you don't have to live in that trauma because people now start to use it to define their life is a weak it's a very weak defense emotionally defensive mechanism that people use especially in dealing with others or in running away from responsibilities because sometimes you say things like oh i can't do this auntie well why can't you do it it's like i've had a is i have had trauma we know but it's now a thing of class to say you've had trauma do you understand what i'm saying this gen z situation since we're having people now use trauma or mental health issues as a way to escape the day and that causes them more mental health issues because they become redundant in their minds and then they start to create fear for themselves that is not there they start to imagine things that are not there so someone for example i'll use um gracie's um example of falling into the into a well at a young age and then now she can't fetch the water at the well because she gets scared one of the ways to quickly move on or care for herself as someone who has been through trauma is to actually stand at that well put the bucket into the well fetch the water it's still imagining that you fell inside those fetch the water do it a few times deliberately do it afraid by the time you're getting to the fifth time trying that the trauma will have gone you will remember the event as something that happened, but you are older now, except if you are still trapped in the body of that three-year-old because of that trauma, and you have other issues that are attached to it. If it is just a singular, isolated, falling into the world situation, or for example, people who have... Um, who have fear for heights for example or fear for water because they've drowned before all of those things the best way and the fastest way to conquer it is to actually go and learn how to swim if you have fear for water if you've seen someone drown before i had fear for horses because i saw a classmate kill get killed by a horse at the beach so every time i go to the beach i don't want to ride a horse i love horses i admire them i know a lot about horses but you see me ride on that horse no way but i've told myself it has happened a long time ago the horse if i take care of myself on the horse and i have someone with me horse will not kill me now do you understand what i'm saying that was just a mistake it was one event is what we call overgeneralization in cognitive behavioral therapy don't overgeneralize the situation it was an isolated situation so for me the first care and the most important care is face your trauma that's the first care let them heal you know let it be have been a long time in fact the immediately the person has the trauma the best thing you want to do is carry that person and go and stand in front of that traumatic place it will let them go crazy so sorry let me share this and then i'll like i'll like ehi to maybe you know put her own in it as well um when people die when people lose people when they're dealing with grief there's a nigerian saying that 
don't cry yo don't cry that's number one mistake that we make in telling people that have lost people not to cry what do you mean they just lost someone they love what is don't cry or they tell all the boys now nah, man you be you can't be crying you, what does that even mean why do you have tear dogs for crying out loud sorry i get very emotional when i say talk about things that nigerians do that pains me <laughs> so don't be worried about my my tone you know and you see that someone is grieving and they're going through pain and they've lost someone and they want to see the body of the person for example and they want to fall over the body of the person or they want to cry over the person you see people holding them back don't do that take the body away don't let her see it you are causing more problem because that thing now becomes like a memory that did not happen let them go in front of the dead body let them roll themselves on it let them see the person they will heave they will cry they will not die from crying they can't die from crying they will everything will happen but the fact that they had confronted and seen that person and understood and their brain has absorbed it that i've lost someone that i love is a painful situation but you have caught their trauma by half because now is a reality that this person is gone they are no longer going to see it as a dream they are no longer going to think that it is it was something that didn't happen they will come to peace quickly because they are able to register their mind has registered it as this is an event that happened that i witnessed and i have to move on from it they move on faster you know so for me that confronting that dealing allowing the person go there and deal with the issue that's the first care is the scariest i will tell you usually they'll tell you pamper the person give the person a reason to leave give the person but if you have a professional um mental health counselor with you they can guide you through the process of wailing and letting go of confronting that thing and seeing that that thing is not as harmful as you think it is even for sexual abuse that one person abuse you does not mean that all men are like that that's over generalization yeah. you know so so that's that's what i i would say okay thank you i remember that um <laughs> i had an experience similar like that and on getting to see the body which was actually my best friend so the parents were there in fact the mom nobody wanted her to go you know we're all emotional I, at that point i don't even know what i was i was thinking okay because i've actually never seen a dead body and as my friend to actually be the first one i'm saying so we're all emotional and there are some persons that wouldn't want the mom to go and i was like no even if i'm not practicing anything now let's just i, I was not even thinking about counseling or anything because it was far far behind <laughs> at that point but she she went there we went there together she saw her daughter she cried in fact at that point all the things she were not able to say to her she was able to say it to the person or the body lying there and it helped her um, come in terms with the fact that the daughter was is gone the daughter is gone so i think yes allowing that person express their feeling at that point is actually a good deal you know she she cried we all cried but you know the idea of people telling them hey you don't have to cry you don't have to do this and uh, clean your eyes <laughs> that's really absurd like let them experience the tears the tears is there for you to cry and then you become okay you know get to the peak of it and then you'll be fine after the whole tears but telling yeah. the person to hold it back i don't i don't really see um any any distance there but thank you for really sharing that it really it's that's really personal for me you know i don't have to stay in that i've moved past it's not like i've i've uh, um, overcome it like how will i put it it's not like i don't think about her yeah but i don't get um the fact that okay i saw her lying there she's no longer there and yeah all that you know affects me so mm. that's really good hey grace can you um share more light on this like self-care practices you can recommend for individuals that have experienced trauma okay yeah. Like, 
she said earlier on, let them cry you need to cry. Yeah, I'm not a fan of holding that pain. If you need to shout, if you need to go to the streets to shout, please do. It's very important. It causes holding in pain causes so much harm than good to the body mentally. Let me share from personal experience. When I lost my dad, then I was quite young, probably like 15. So I was going through a lot of emotions. And somebody said, don't cry. But I remember the one woman said, make sure that I let her cry. If, if she wants to shout, let her shout. And I realized that crying and letting those pains out literally did me a lot of good. Because after that day, seeing his body made me realize that, okay, the truth is this man is born. You now have your life to live. So for me, it was no longer like a dream. But for people that don't cry, or probably when they lose their loved ones, you don't let them see it. You just feel like, ah, it feels like I'm dreaming. And that can literally affect the person mentally. Then another self-care is forgive yourself. Forgiving ourselves can be very hard. But I think that one conscious thing I have to tell people that are going through pains or probably certain issues and life have happened to them. I tell them, I like, say, forgive yourself. I know sometimes when we go through certain things, we blame ourselves that if I wasn't in this location at this particular time probably this has this would not have happened if i was there for him probably he would have not died like stuff like that but at the long run we need to learn how to forgive ourselves give yourself like i would say breathe just breathe let your body rest let your mind rest then another important self-care for me is journaling i don't know i'm a fan of writing so writing even if there's nobody to speak to so much I get to write a lot. So all of those memories that have been, that are so painful. I think writing them down for me makes me forget. Even if it's not like hundred percent forgetting. I know that the burdens I have in my heart, I'm I'm sharing it out. If you like I my journal and read it's your business. But I just know that I'm letting out those burdens that have been there, those burdens that I've held in. So for me, forgiving yourself is it's very important then the act of journaling you might feel like it's just writing but there's a lot of journaling does to our mental brain it helps you release stress it helps you lay down a lot of burdens because like writing now is more like you're having a conversation especially for people that don't really know how to talk to somebody then i also advise having a safe space where you can speak to um having a safe space where you can have com um, conversations with somebody for me now, I have friends that whatever happens in life, I can easily go to them and cry on their shoulders, give them 100% details. But that kind of this thing can be very hard because not everybody is that open. Not everybody would want to trust somebody to share. But having somebody where, having somebody that you can share those pains with is literally very important. It will help you know that, okay, irrespective of anything i'm not going through this alone my brain is not running mad so yeah 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 thank you i can recall that um when i lost that my friend like we were in the hospital we spent a year in the hospital and she wanted before she passed on she told me she was like, like blessing i want to eat cashew nut do you know when she said she wanted to eat cashew nut, I actually looked for cashew nut for 24 hours. I didn't see cashew nut. So I was supposed to like go to the hospital. Okay, I finally got the cashew nut the next day. But I wasn't able to take that cashew nut to the hospital that day I got it. So I was like, okay, since I got it today, I'll take it tomorrow. So it was that tomorrow they now called me that we I picked up this blame like if I'd given her the cash probably <laughs> probably she might not die or probably I might have seen her at least before she if at all she was going to pass on. There was this blame, it's beautiful, okay? 
and everyone will definitely pass so I, I i i i literally have to start learning how to forgive myself because of that so i learned how to and many people experience the same thing mm -hmm, many yeah. people do that's it so forgiving yourself that is really amazing i i, I took it but <laughs> i actually did not place it there you know but now that you've made me understand that that is it and then along the line i took journaling that's writing as my daily routine i wake up in the morning i do my to-do list but when i find my to-do list overwhelming i scrap it because anything that is overwhelming and giving me stress i don't want so i'll just scrap <laughs> so i write i write my feelings that's really amazing thank you for sharing and also you you made mention about communicating with people people that know you your friends people that you can really rely on that's also interesting or that's also great if you have the right people the positive people because you need positive people you don't just want to go and um, I <laughs> random yeah yes, exactly not even a random person someone you know that can always put you down you know there are, there are negative people like that that wants to they know what you're going through but they just want to add more pressure to you and then dismiss you like your feelings are not valid so once you your feelings are very irrespective of how small or insignificant that you feel those feelings are no matter how small if you if you're angry with somebody today your feelings are valid that you're angry irrespective of whatever the person does your feelings are valid tell yourself my feelings are valid then know what to do now know how to tackle it the right way because some of us we make decisions based on our feelings and that's where it can really get bad because sometimes your feelings shouldn't make you shouldn't let you make major decisions that you would probably leave to regret yeah we should always watch our feelings mm. you know try to sit with it because most persons they they react instantly because they're angry they start reacting angry and later on that's when they will not um, realize what they've done but already the damage has been done that's amazing <clears throat> okay and then this brings us to another question like the trauma informed care now we all know that we have to create awareness we have to you know take it to put it out there so individuals know what trauma is the community knows what trauma is is there any success story at all that we can say this trauma informed care worked is there any 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 story in the probably in the community settings and all that even the trauma they went through and when they got healed out of those trauma and how they literally lived their life and they are speaking like they're literally very very loud about Address Maya and Robert. Okay, um, Tessie, can we hear from you too? Yeah, so, um, my success stories, I won't call them mine because, um, I, as a, as a counselor and a therapist, you get to live your client's life for every hour that you spend with them you literally wear their shoes you know so for me my success stories have been that the the people who i have helped the clients who have helped through traumatic experiences who come back and usually how i how i know that it's working is this person is able to live through that event again and the emotion they showed the first time they lived through the event is not the same that they show at the end of the session so at the end of the therapy session so it is that time where you understand that this person has come to a place of congruence with the situation that they are going through with whatever it is they are dealing with i think one that will stand out for me is someone who had fear of you know making new friends now you know she because of the experiences she's had and all of that and then she is now deciding to join a club 
uh, where she's going to meet loads of people that she doesn't know. And she would have to interact with them and meet new people. That just shows someone who is doing it afraid. And that's what we want to encourage in people. Also, to say that the success stories, aside from this one I mentioned, that will stand out for me going forward, is that we have more people coming up to say, hey, after I went through my um, trauma-informed care with my therapist, I was able to understand that I'm not alone. I was able to understand that um, it's not about me. The, the, that it happened to me does not mean I was singled out. It's just one of those things that happens, you know, and I have to take that and use it as a yardstick to make myself better. It should remind me to be better. Those are the kind of success stories we want to start aiming for. Some people, it may take two years to completely heal. It may take three years. In fact, you never completely heal from trauma because it's a scar. It leaves a scar. The wound is healed. But the scar will always be there and you will always remember it. Yes, you will always remember. But how you react when you remember the situation is what shows if you have overcome that trauma or you still have it with you and you need to let it out. And one final thing is I want us to start having success stories of people physically letting out their trauma. There isn't a lot of people talking about um, physically expressing your trauma, releasing them from different parts of your body, your chest. For some people, the reason you have that hunched back is because there's a lot of weight you're carrying on your inside from the trauma you've faced. That hunchback is not normal. It's not fat. Like some will say, it is not, you know, it is just the weight of the traumatic experiences you've had. You need to understand that your body stores these traumatic experiences and access how to, we need to learn more how to teach people to physically let go of their trauma. Those are the success stories I want to hear. I've not had any, but the more I study about it and then I will give it a try, I'm sure that the stories will begin to change, you know. Yeah. Let me share mine with you then. Okay, so, you know, I said I, I lost my friend, and that was like two years ago, okay? And this is the person that, when I came to this town newly, I met her when I came to this town. And then she took me in like a sister, you know, best of best. I don't really have plenty of friends. But if I have that one friend, I know that that one friend, we are, we are, always like sharing ideas things together and that sort of thing so when she passed the first year was you know, you know intense i frequently visit the mom but then i stopped visiting but i call on the phone you know because i thought probably the frequent scene would also Always remind her because we're very close. Okay, so but um, this year, actually, when I saw the brochure for the burial, so I was arranging my bag. It's usually September 10th, so I was arranging my box and I saw the. I just smiled. Though from the onset, I have accepted. Okay, that she's not there anymore, and. In my mind, I think good about her to be in a better place, not here. And when I saw that paper, I just smiled. I smiled because I knew she's in a better place. I knew she wants us. She's this very lively person that if you're with her, you're already. You know, she keeps the place bubbling. And, and the only thought that came to me was thought. We, we we had our fallings, of course. Friends will fight, will quarrel, and the next second she call me and then insult me, and then we, we make up. You see, but then when I saw that, I just started smiling. As I was smiling, I was actually crying, letting out all the tears. But it wasn't like the tears of the first time when I lost her. This is like a tears of, wow. So you're in a better place now. You see, I had to let go and, and I think letting go of that hurt, letting go of the fact that I couldn't see her, it was everything. To me, that is because I've moved 
um, the pain. I now see her memory as something beautiful. I'm having her in my heart as a beautiful memory that I have um, when I came in here and I'm still, but I'm still enjoying the benefit because I can just call the moment. <laughs> just so. <laughs> I think that that's a success story, don't you think? <laughs> I agree. It's a success story. I do agree. Are you, are you there? So you found one. <laughs> we are, this, this is our last question for today. So we have to um, round up and go take our rest. It's, it has been a long day. Um, what resources and support are available for those affected by trauma? Like, do you have a resource can, um, that they can talk to? Probably you can share with your social media and do if you um, specialize on that. Because I know people are watching this. We'll share it on our platforms. People will still see this. So it's vital that if you have those resources you share to the audience okay so can um, can before a okay so um i yes first I, of all, I want to say thank you for this event i do not know you i'm just meeting you for the first time uh, as in like seeing your picture but i'm part of a community that you created and i think that that's a very great thing to do where people can come together and really share as professionals how we can help each other advocates and everyone who just loves mental health so thank you for that it, it really shows that you have a heart to help people you know for resources to do that <laughs> and i love your haircuts by the way oh, thank if, 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 I, was if I wasn't on, if I wasn't on audio, I would have showed you my white hair because I'm also on low cut. Mine is white. I was on black too. I just moved it. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, for resource, um, for those who weren't, I have a a Facebook page called Love and Light Therapy. I just shared it on the comment session. Now it's called Love and Light Therapy. Once you just type love and and as in the sign the and sign and love it like love the light therapy rather on facebook and then for it's at love underscore therapy love light underscore therapy once you go to instagram and you type that you would also find you know me there most importantly i am a mental health counselor i'm also a relationship and a marriage therapist meaning i help you with your relationship issues and when people hear relationship you think love 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 it's not just about man and woman love it's actually friendships family relationships colleagues whatever relationship you're thinking about i'm also there to help you through that trauma depression name it yeah i'm there for you and i'm also a coach i coach more on self-discovery and um, cognitive behavioral um reconditioning i do those two and so people are wondering what cognitive is is it okay if i just share a bit on what cognitive reconditioning is so cognitive reconditioning therapy is basically where we take the mind where we work on your mind to start to think better in a way that your life is better because for everything that you're seeing in your life today it is because of what you think and how you think there's nothing you want to tell me it's not your village people it's not anything you are attracting what you know and who you are you will never attract all those riches and all those luxury you're looking for because that's not who you are you don't believe in it you just wish it it's not a belief it's not how you think you don't believe it so what we do with that is that we help you go through a process of changing how you think of reconditioning your mind from the way it was conditioned in that village where you grew up or in that home where you grew up like how um he was talking about you know marriage and separation we do that we get you to that point where you start to see marriage for what it is not what you saw you know 
so that's basically what i do and i'm open to that i have an event coming up soon um i wish i could share the flyer here but i'll probably send it to you it's for self-discovery and it's free completely free it's a free webinar you can just come in for one hour 30 minutes we're going to be talking about self-discovery how to find yourself you know so that's me my name is tessie and those are the resources i have the other resources are not mine so i can't give them names but however if you come in contact with me i can share some you know videos youtube videos and certain contacts with you that can give you the information that you need yeah thank you for sharing this with us please let's visit love and life therapy on facebook and on instagram Hey Grace, can you please share some with us? Okay, for our Instagram, it's at love light underscore therapy for Instagram. For Facebook is love and light therapy. Please let's visit Tessie for more information on her services and resources that you can get. And trust me, you'd be amazed, seriously. Grace, I hope you're there. Please, can you share some courses with us? Okay, yes, I am. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. It was really, it was really an honor. It was really privileged being here. Thank you. Thank you for actually doing this, and especially your community. That place is really amazing. A place for growth. Thank you so much. Ah. Uh, Okay, for me, I think um, most of the people I really work with are adolescents, children and teenagers, especially. I'm a psychologist for teenagers and a counselor for specialty. So what I do is I sometimes go to schools and have private counseling sessions with them. So I'm currently doing a school tour in Abuja and Nashrawa, going to different schools, having counseling sessions. So if you know it's cool that you probably ask, ah, oh, these children, they really need counseling. My DM is open because personally, I think what even inspired me to go into adolescence, I feel like our homes really need to do better with our teenagers. And so sometimes those care actually not really giving to them. I can understand because our friends would be like, work, 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 work. But beyond work, I just feel like there's more our teenagers need to do so you can check out my personal page the Eggy grace i share most of the things i actually work with on that page okay can you put your the name of your personal page on the so the text so people can see it okay yes i will yeah i'll write it out now now, currently, I'm building, not really, not really an NGO, but like a community for teenagers building things in Africa. But currently, at the startup stage, but the goal is to ensure that we reach as many teenagers as we can to ensure that these children grow up, have a lot of um, self development experiment. Yeah. Yes, that's amazing. I, I um, earlier this year, I actually wanted to work with schools on help to. So that's amazing. You can always do when you have um, things like that coming up. It's amazing. Please, this is um, A. Grace. So she offers counseling, individual counseling sessions too. Um, and if you need any other resources, our social media handle will be on the comment section. So always feel free to reach out to any one of them. Okay. And we, we all can actually link up. I live in Abuja too, Tessie. Since we all are in Abuja. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, oh, that's really nice. I didn't know you're in Abuja as well. Cool. So we should hook up. Yeah. Yes, we should. One yeah. of these days, yeah? Yeah. We should. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to say thank you especially to the both of you for honoring me with your amazing present that, you know, <laughs> that are mind-blowing. And I believe the audience too, that will be watching this now and in the future, would actually take something home from this. Because I have, I have understood that 
um, creating awareness is key. Okay, putting information out there is very important. I've also um, understood that incorporating this awareness, it should start with the family. If we as a family can do this, of course the community become easier and a better place for us. So information is very vital and this information should start from the family. It should start from um, from the family then to the community okay and also um i wrote down that trauma is more than just abuse yes because we feel like the only thing we can call trauma is when somebody's being raped when somebody's um, being violated and all this stuff but trauma is more than that where i had to actually give my own experience of how eba has caused me trauma <laughs> And now I've stopped eating it, but so trauma is way more than just emotional abuse. Okay. Um, I also wrote that the, the feeling or the emotion a pregnant woman carries during her pregnancy can affect the child. So as an expecting mother, a mother who is expecting, you have to learn so you don't transfer the negativity child. Okay, so please let's watch that and learn from this. Thank you so much for sharing. And also, be aggressive in the awareness. You have to be aggressive. You have to learn. You have to learn. Learn things that will empower you. It's very important. And as a professional, I also be biased, okay, when you're dealing with someone with trauma and you should boundaries with your clients. Know where your boundary starts, know where your boundaries not, not judge them. Don't, don't be judgmental, okay? Be your family member and if you cannot, if you know you're not able to handle um, a case by your loved one, please refer that loved one to another counselor, to another therapist. It's very important to do so. And also I learned that you don't stay in your trauma. You have to face it. Don't dwell in that past. Move to the future. Very important. Don't overgeneralize. Don't let your brain tell you something else. Don't overthink it and don't overgeneralize it. It is important. And also forgive yourself in dealing with this trauma for you to move past it you have to forgive yourself it is important and also journaling is a great key for you to write out your emotions if you feel like you're not able to talk to someone instantly you can start writing out your emotions and then you connect with loved ones connect with loved ones it's important to connect with loved ones the ones that are positive please connect with positive loved ones to help you move forward in your healing journey and also um, please don't forget to visit Tessie on her um, Instagram page and on her Facebook love and light therapy and love light underscore therapy on Instagram and also a grace please you guys should visit them for more resources on your social media handle and I want to say thank you to every one of you that I've watched this video, video where, where, whenever you've seen it, I want to say thank you for everything. Um, um, Tessa, do you have any final thoughts or closing remark you want to tell them? The audience, your final thoughts do you have? Uh, nothing really. I mean, like we've said everything. Um, I'll just say, a therapist don't be shy don't think it's too expensive the same way if you had malaria you would go to the hospital to go have it checked out and pay for drugs and go to the pharmacy that's how important your mental health counselor is don't be afraid to reach out for help your mental health is as important as your physical health if you don't take care of your mental health you will spend a lot of money in the hospital but if you can take care of your mental health trust me you will not have to go to the hospital for a very long time yeah that's me signing out <laughs> it's all right thank you
thank you very much it's nice meeting you beautiful ladies and i really had fun and it's amazing i hope we'll continue to do this again we'll continue to spread the word out there put the awareness out there so people understand these things and not <clears throat> and not hide in their shell when they should be talking about it so thank you very much and i hope to see you in your next program in your event because i'll be there <laughs> All right, see you then. I'll share the flyer with you. And have a bye. bye. Yes, bye. Thank you. <laughs>